When Jesus is baptized in the Gospel of Mark, he sees the heavens torn apart. He has come into this life bringing heaven with him. It falls in, you might say, dragging behind. The dome of the sky is hanging in pieces. Earth and heaven are all mixed up now. Jesus obliterates the distinction. This is really good news, for the kingdom is at hand. And now heaven demonstrates its urgency. The revelation of the power and mercy of God in Jesus is evident in his rejection of Satan, the rejection of temptation in the wilderness, and it's beginning to manifest itself in healings and in teachings and its accruing followers. It's as if heaven has come as a party of raiders. How many times have you heard it said, the Lord comes like a thief in the night? Indeed, Jesus will say in chapter 3 of Mark, in describing himself and his disciples, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed, the house can be plundered. Satan is the strong man in that scenario. And the house in question is the house of Satan, the world. And so in effect, Jesus says, I'm dropping in with my guys, we're coming in hot. We are tying up Satan and we're taking the world for God's good ends. Heaven has come, deal with it. And if we haven't gotten it yet, here's another from chapter two. They bring a paraplegic to Jesus, carried by four men and the crowd is so great at the door, so they go up and they remove part of the roof and they lower the paraplegic on his stretcher. Impressed by their bold belief, Jesus says to the paraplegic, Son, I forgive you your sins. Some religion scholars who are standing around start whispering among themselves, He can't talk that. He doesn't get to talk like that. That's blasphemy. God and only God can forgive sins. Jesus knows right away what they're thinking. And he says, why are you so skeptical? What's easier for me to say to this man, I forgive you your sins, or to say, get up, take your stretcher, and start walking? Well, just so it's clear, that I'm the Son of God and authorized to do either or both. He looks at the paraplegic and says, get up, pick up your stretcher and go home. And the man does just that. Gets up, grabs his stretcher and walks out with everyone there watching him. They rub their eyes incredulous and then praise God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Don't miss this image. They rip a hole out of the roof of the house in order to lower down a live demonstration of what heaven looks like. If you've ever been to that site in the city of Capernaum, you know because you stand right on where that roof would have been. Heaven looks like healing. 
That ought to remind us of Jesus' baptism, of all these things coming together. Heaven looks like a man who has no feeling in his lower extremities getting a second shot. Heaven is something announced and seen and heard in this instance. The house of Satan in the realm of the world is getting plundered. And all these expectations about a Messiah are getting flipped in the process. Heaven makes a big, loud, crashing entrance. The folks are astounded. And the religious professionals suddenly have nothing to say. Now, add to all these things, this powerful healing we have just heard about from the floor of the local house of prayer in the town of Capernaum, same town. It begins by reporting that those gathered to hear Jesus' teaching are impressed shocked, maybe a little scandalized to hear his words. But they do hear, feel, receive his authority. A man appears bearing the weight of an unclean spirit, and that malicious and burdensome spirit knows who Jesus is, but Jesus isn't interested in that word getting out just yet. So he tells the spirit to shut its mouth and get lost. Sometimes, you know, Jesus will spar with the esteemed teachers of the law. Sometimes it's all erudite philosophy and chains of logic. But sometimes it's what we on the playground used to call, my dad can beat your dad. A fallen angel and his minions are no match for the Son of God freshly arrived from the heavenly throne room. The power of God is the power to move the needle for good, for justice, for peace, for love. There's a swift and accelerating power in the name and presence of Jesus and the rule of heaven will trail and expand from him. Satan was already tied, plundered, and defeated back in the wilderness. He's done. This is game over. It only remains for the witnesses on the scene in Capernaum to testify to an even higher level of authority than what they've already been impressed by. This is authority backed up by heavenly power. It is the power of God to change things and people and circumstances immediately, visibly, tangibly for good. But the danger we face today in hearing this is to keep it on the pages of the bulletin, which we'll recycle, of course. Three more years, we'll hear it again. Or keep it up there in the gospel book. Because the power of God can be so strange when it's so nakedly presented as it is here in the first few chapters of Mark. Modern brains uh, believe healing can only come by other means, less mythological means. So we tend to regard these passages, uh, what? Like a sock that missed laundry day. We hold them out at some distance. Just don't want to get too close to them. The danger with these healing miracles is not in the stories themselves. It's in the temptation we feel in regard to them, to let them just be characters on the page, right? Black words on a white page. Some historical oddity that we don't know what to do with. So we keep them far apart from us. 
separated by two millennia of history, compartmentalized in our sensible brains, holding Jesus back as some tamed and diluted form of philanthropy or maybe just a good teacher of philosophy and ethics. Perhaps we are too rational to earnestly engage these stories any more deeply than we do. Or maybe we're quick to say, the man in the synagogue got his healing, why didn't I get mine? And stop believing Jesus says who he is and that he is who he says he is because, let's face it, it's too much to hold in our minds at once. The beauty of the faith community is that we don't walk away. If we walk away, we walk away from ourselves and one another. And so coming here week by week or day by day, it's a form of doubling down. We go back to the well, and then we go out, and then we come back again. We engage and we re-engage and we learn at ever more critical depths and we tell strangers what we're seeing. We study and pray and we ask each other about it and we ask God to illuminate our minds and hearts about it. We'd be fools to think we could ever limit the efficacy, reach, and power of God. If we go down that road, that's our deal. That's not God's deal. It doesn't change the fact that heaven has come crashing through, and it's up to us to decide how we're going to respond. So instead, choose joy. Choose devotion and admiration. Choose to work and play and study and pray in the light of the truth and power of God. Choose Christ at every moment of opportunity, and you will not be disappointed. Today and every day, stand in the reality of the power of God. Amen.